Anywhere with Jesus I can safely go. Anywhere he leads me in this world below. Anywhere without him dearest choice would fade. Anywhere with Jesus I am not afraid. Anywhere, anywhere, fear I cannot know. Anywhere with Jesus I can safely go. Anywhere with Jesus I am not alone. Other friends may fail me, he is still my own. Though his hand may lead me over clearest ways. Anywhere with Jesus is a house of praise. Anywhere, anywhere, fear I cannot know. Anywhere with Jesus I can safely go. Anywhere with Jesus over land and sea. Telling souls in darkness of salvation free. Ready as he summons me to go or stay. Anywhere with Jesus when he points the way. Anywhere, anywhere, fear I cannot go. Anywhere with Jesus I can safely go. Anywhere with Jesus I can go to sleep. When the darkening shadows round about me creep. Knowing I shall wake and never more to roam. Anywhere with Jesus will be home, sweet home. Anywhere, anywhere, fear I cannot go. Anywhere with Jesus I can safely go. He leadeth me, O blessed thought, O words, with heavenly comfort from. Whatever I do, wherever I be, still tis God's hand that leadeth me. He leadeth me, he leadeth me, by his own hand he leadeth me. His faithful follower I would be, for by his hand he leadeth me. Sometimes it seems a deepest gloom, sometimes where Eden's towers loom. By waters still or troubles see, still tis God's hand that leadeth me. He chapter 6 where David is trying to move the ark of God because he wants to move it 
to the place where it's going to rest in the city of Jerusalem. But he does so in an improper way. He tries to put it on a cart, and he tries to have cows pull it. When that's not how it was supposed to be done. It was supposed to be a certain clan who was supposed to carry it in a certain way with poles in a certain manner, and they didn't do it that way. And so they put it on a cart, and at some point the oxen stumbled, and a man named Uzzah reached out his hand to study the ark, thinking to himself that he might keep the ark from falling off the cart. Well, right then and there, God struck Uzzah dead for this transgression against the covenant, as well as this fulfillment of the promise that if anybody touches the ark, they will die. This is one of many stories in the Old Testament and a fulfillment of the type of laws God gave in the books of Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, uh, where God has said over and over again and continues to prove, even up till today, that he will be honored in the way that he will be honored. We don't get to choose how we worship him. He chooses how we worship him, and he wants to be worshiped in his way and not in our way, with dire consequences on the line. As we approach and think about and ponder on the idea of the Lord's Supper, we remember that we are told to look at ourselves and consider ourselves and test ourselves. Because this is a very serious thing that we're doing. All worship is, but what worship is more serious than the communion with God? If we're going to be communing with God, we ought to make sure that we are ready and that we are prepared and that we are not doing so flippantly and in our way, but we do so with very serious manners and with a very serious attitude. We focus on the death, burial, and especially the resurrection of Jesus Christ as we focus on his blood that washes us clean. And in doing this, We remind ourselves how amazing our God is and how seriously we ought to focus on praising him in his way. So as we do this, I ask that you be careful to do this in a a manner that is worthy and pleasing to him. Examine yourself. And just because we are away and at home, we don't take this lightly. We take this as seriously as our God is. Let's pray for the bread. Let's pray for the bread. Father, we are so thankful and mindful right now for your son's body that lay upon the cross for hours in anguish. And as terrible as that suffering is, we are thankful for it. Because of what it means to us, we are thankful for Jesus, the perfect sacrifice, his body that he was willing to give to inhabit for us, that God was willing to come incarnate because of our sinful selves. God, we are so thankful for the redemption that we find in this sacrifice. And as we eat this, we ask that you teach us to take this moment and this time with severity and give you the honor that you are due. We pray these things in your son's name. Amen. Let's pray for the cup. Father, we thank you so much for the blood of the covenant that your son shed for us, that his physical lifeblood was pouring out of his body so that it might pour over us, so that we might be cleansed, so that we might stand before your throne on the day of judgment, and you might not see us in our sin-marred self, but that you might see the blood of Christ that covers us and see us as holy and righteous, so that you might tell us, well done, good and faithful servant, but only because of the sacrifice of your Son. God, we thank you for this time of communion that even though we might not be together physically in person, we can have this time where we are all taking the same moment, the same time in this worship to focus on you and to have communion with you and with one another. We pray these things in your son's name. Amen. Thank you for tuning in, beloved. This is the Bumper Sticker Philosophy Part 2. Our scripture reading comes from John chapter 19, verses 19 through 22 to begin. 
If you have your text, please turn there now. It reads, Now Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross, and the writing was, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Then many of the Jews read this title, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. Therefore the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but he said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. You know, society's original social media site was the back of each driver's bumper. Sticker after sticker after sticker. People prefer to let the world know what they think in such a short space of words. Whether constructive or destructive, these little snippets of wisdom are often issue-driven and worldview-acknowledging. So what should Christians do about promoting their own bumper stipper, sticker philosophies? And where else in society do these kinds of messages need to be thoughtfully considered before we endorse them? You know, a good question to ask is how many hours you spend in a vehicle each day. And according to Steinbeck and Teff from the American Driving Survey of 2022, conducted by AAA Foundation for Traffic Safety, apparently 60.2 minutes and 30.1 miles each day is the average in America. That's an incredible amount of time to be looking at somebody else's bumper. And so as we consider what bumper stickers we might see in the world, as I mentioned before, this is part two of a series, and we're going to examine one and two more in addition to the two we've covered last time. All right, so the Darwin fish. Is this mockery plus macroevolution? You know, fish and land animals were not even created on the same day if we accept the account of creation week in Genesis to be the literal narrative of the events unfolding approximately 6,000 years ago. Fish were created on day five, according to Genesis chapter one, verses 20 through 22. Then God said, let the waters abound with an abundance of living creatures and let birds fly above the earth across the face of the firmament of the heavens. So God created great sea creatures and every living thing that moves with which the waters abounded according to their kind and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. And God blessed them saying, be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters in the sea and let birds multiply on the earth. According to verse 23, so the evening and the morning were the fifth day. Now, land animals were created on day six. Genesis chapter one, verses 24 and 25 communicate this. Then God said, let the earth bring forth the living creature according to its kind, cattle and creeping thing and beast of the earth, each according to its kind. And it was so. And God made the beast of the earth according to its kind, cattle according to its kind, and every living, everything that creeps on the earth according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. If you drop down to verse 31, then God saw everything that he had made, and indeed it was very good. So the evening and the morning were the sixth day. Now, why am I reading these passages in Genesis? And what is the Darwin fish? So Charles Darwin, who is most famous for sailing to the Galapagos Island on a ship named the HMS Beagle, is responsible for laying the groundwork or extending the groundwork into a theory of evolution and specifically the macro evolution in which from all ancestors all living things today we can find an original life form so that all things whether plant or animal creeping things like bugs all the way to the size of a blue whale that all of us have some kind of common ancestry so this is the claim of macroevolution and if you remember from our previous study when we looked at the jesus fish this is kind of a mockery of that so it's taking the jesus fish as we've already explained the meaning of that in the previous lesson and now it's applying something that is meant to uh, countermand the 
religious claims of the Bible, if you will. And so it does stand as a mockery. And really, this should be evidence that the two were never supposed to go together. I hear some Christians say, well, it's possible that we could have all evolved this way, and, and therefore the Bible and macroevolution could be true. And yet, if that were the case, why the mockery here? So clearly, those that are um, on the side of Darwin, Charles Darwin, and all of the contemporaries that favor his perspectives, this is meant to be taken as a mockery of the creator in the world that we have. Now, one thing I want you to note about the creation story is that these kinds that were brought into creation remain the same from the creation to the flood, and then even from the flood to the modern age. Look at the language that's presented in Genesis chapter 9, verses 9 through 13. This is Noah. He's come off the ark. All the animals are descending from the ark, and this is what God says. And as for me, behold, I establish my covenant with you and with your descendants after you and with every living creature that is with you. So that's interesting because the covenant that God establishes here is actually with the living creatures themselves. Now, what does he say in this covenant about the living creatures? Here it is. The birds, the cattle, and every beast of the earth with you, of all that go out of the ark, every beast of the earth, Thus I establish my covenant with you. Never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of the flood. Never again shall there be, shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, this is the sign of the covenant which I make between you, me and you, and every living creature that is with you for perpetual generations. Okay, so this covenant continues to guide the very framework of living beings today. And you notice how he categorized everything. Those, those same categories were present at creation. So what was present at creation is brought up again during Noah's flood and afterwards, and that continues to be the kinds of animals we see today. So there's not room here in Genesis for something to explain all living things today. One, one ancestral being that can explain all living things today, apart from God, of course, as our creator. And yet, that doesn't mean that microevolution, which is a concept that creationists very much are in favor of, in which within each animal kind, there will be slight modifications over the years, color changes, sizes and beaks, other things of this sort, and those micro adaptations that happen over time are certainly a part of the flexibility that God brought into his creation. So we don't deny that there can be a variety within a kind. What we deny or what we don't see possible from the scriptures is that you can get the variety of all kinds from one source animal or being. Now, unfortunately, mockers still repudiate the most fundamental building blocks of what is true. And they do this to the detriment of their own speciation version of the theory of evolution. No evidence, no links, no way to account for life's existence. All these are unresolved. It's evolution of the gaps, as we might say, running rampant. And so scoffing against God, to me, is at the core of this entire issue. I think about Second Peter chapter 3, verses five through seven, in which Peter the apostle writes, for this they will fully forget that by the word of God, the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of the water and in water by which the world that then existed perished being flooded with water. But the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. There's a study of 10,000 internet users from 24 countries and it was reported in nature in 2022 the title of this uh, article was credibility score people put their trust in scientists and i'm getting this from should science trump scripture part of reason and revelation from apologetics press written by jeff miller in 2023 and so here's the quote. Here's what they found. 
People are more likely to believe a cryptic claim if it comes from a scientist than from a spiritual guru. The researchers found that regardless of their country or level of religiosity, participants regarded absurd claims from a scientist as more credible than those from a spiritual leader. It reminds me of uh, something I read in Charles Swindle's book, Living Above the Level of Mediocrity. He has this entry, which I find very fascinating. Uh, years ago, a psychologist named Ruth W. Berenda and her associates carried out an interesting experiment with teenagers designed to show how a person handled group pressure. The plan was simple. They brought groups of 10 adolescents into a room for a test, and subsequently each group of 10 was instructed to raise their hands when the teacher pointed to the longest line on three separate charts. What one person in the group did not know was that nine of the others in the room had been instructed ahead of time to vote for the second longest line. Regardless of the instructions they heard, once they were all together in the group, the nine were not to vote for the longest line, but rather for the next to the longest line. The experiment began with nine teenagers voting for the wrong line. The stooge, as he's referred to, or she is referred to here, would typically glance around, frown in confusion, and slip his hand up with the group. The instructions were repeated, and the next card was raised. Time after time, the self-conscious stooge would sit there saying a short line is longer than a long line, simply because he lacked the courage to challenge the group. This remarkable conformity occurred in about 75% of the cases and was true of small children and high school students as well. Berenda concluded that, quote, some people had rather be president than right, which is certainly an accurate assessment, end quote. And so we're reminded of Galatians chapter 6, verse 7, do not be deceived, God is not mocked, for whatever a man sows, that will he also reap. I find a double meaning in this passage. Not only will man reap what he sows, and we should expect what is reaped to come from what is sowed, but that's exactly the truism that's a part of microevolution. Each kind of animal sows the exact same kind of animal, and this continual generation after generation of one animal yielding the exact same form of an animal those slight modifications, perhaps, and variations may exist. It is reaping the same thing that has been sowed. As I mentioned, creationists recognize natural selection, which is one of those concepts that was pioneered by Charles Darwin. But in the sense that certain traits live on in a species while other traits pass out of the gene pool when survival of the fittest is at play in the world. Clearly, that's happening over time. Finch is developing different beak sizes and different beak shapes on the Galapagos Islands fit this description of microevolution. But the finch suddenly growing wings from a separate land animal, which if you go back far enough, once swam in the sea as yet another species, uh, that makes about as much sense as the Honda Civic four-door sedan, which proudly features the Darwin fish with legs slapped to the back of its bumper, evolving from a Honda Goldwing motorcycle, which proudly features the Darwin fish without legs slapped to the back of its bumper. Okay, so secondly and finally, would you consider the Coexist bumper sticker? I know you've seen this. This often is confusing to a lot of people. They don't understand what all those symbols are. We're going to identify what all those are. You probably don't see the top image on our slideshow today. You probably are more familiar with the one on the bottom. But as it turns out, the one on top is the original design, which was designed by Polish designer Piotr Melodozinik. I hope I'm pronouncing his name right, in 2000. It was for a contest that was held by a museum located in Jerusalem. The theme for the contest that year was coexistence. This according to a 
an article called The Big Fight Over Coexist from Phil Edwards uh, on June 8, 2016, published in uh, Vox.com. So the original design didn't win any awards, but it did circulate into multiple countries. It was eventually picked up by some college students in Indiana, I believe, and kind of from that point took on a life of its own. It was being put on t-shirts. It was getting into uh, the public eye through movie stars. And as a result, uh, because this image hadn't been copyrighted, people reached out to the original designer and asked for permission. Now this was, this took Piotr completely off guard. He was not expecting it to even be used. And unfortunately over time, this became uh, engraved in pop culture. The band U2 in one of its albums popularized this image. And then from there, it really took off with all the other additions and subtractions with the religious symbols. So the original design with the C and the X and the T in coexist were the symbols for Islam, Judaism, and Christianity. Now, these three do share uh, an admitted relationship in that they all claim to be uh, Abrahamic religions. So they all trace their origins to Abraham. Every single one of those religions makes the claim. So they're in a family of a sense. But what got corrupted was the addition of all these other symbols. Now, Piotr was asked about this, and his problem with the new version of it wasn't legal, but aesthetic. He said it looked really poor and bad, according to this article. And the author here, Phil Edwards, says, despite the differences, the new school of design faced its own legal issues from the Indiana luxury brand. Uh, he mentions he talked to one coexist seller who was hesitant to speak on the record even today because of the legal threats he faced in the mid-2000s. And from there, the coexist logo metastasized even further, forming new random appendages and philosophic and religious associations. Suddenly, Mlodozinic found his own professional identity was tied to a range of coexist logos, none of which represented his aesthetic including the one he designed. And so he's seemingly been uh, distancing himself from uh, the latest phenomenon. And the one you see on the PowerPoint here on the bottom, the current versions of this coexist bumper sticker, I wanna explain what those are. And this comes from an article by Gary Harper from theodysseyonline.com. The C is a symbol for Islam, this crescent moon shape with a star. The O, or we would call that the peace sign, is a symbol for pacifism. That's uh, as of the 20th century, a creation of the 20th century, or at least it's been used in that sense uh, to protest war, for example. The E is a symbol for gay rights or gender equality, and really that depends on whom you're asking. The X is the symbol for Judaism, otherwise known as the Star of David. The I is a symbol for paganism. You'll find this associated with Wicca as a symbol for that uh, occult-like practice. The S is the symbol for Taoism, spelled T-A-O-I-S-M, and Taoism is an, uh, an Asian practice and we associate that symbol more readily with the yin yang. And of course, the T is the symbol of the cross representing Christianity. Now, the real question we need to ask when we see all of this is, can I confess one faith and tolerate all others? And I suppose that depends on what you mean by tolerate. So tolerance used to mean you wouldn't try to harm me for my beliefs and I wouldn't try to harm you for yours. Today, tolerance has been misappropriated to mean I must accept all views as equal to the Christian worldview, even if they contradict, and this we can never do. This modern definition of tolerance should be resisted at all costs, Christians. What shall we say to those who promote Christianity along with contradictory philosophies and religions of the world. What I would say to them is that they need to choose their religious positions 
very carefully. It's true that we can find commendable points about the faith of our neighbors. There is indeed some truth in all religions, but that doesn't make it a true religion. The church should not embrace error or excuse false religions and false faith groups. There's nothing haughty about knowing the truth and defending it when it can be reasonably and honestly demonstrated. Paul wrote, let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not be partakers with them. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. Finding out what is acceptable to the Lord and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 6 through 11. Christianity is inclusive of all, but all must practice Christianity exclusively. That's the key. Anyone can be a Christian so long as they are a Christian only. See, God designed it that way. He designed it that way so that followers of Christ would be distinct. It's hard to read gray colored letters when they appear typed on a gray sheet of paper, isn't it? Instead, the church is likened to bright lights against a dark sky. How is my light shining in the darkness? How is yours? Are you the light of the world, a city that is set on a hill which cannot be hidden? Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Matthew chapter 5, verses 14 through 16. Is salvation in any other but Jesus Christ? We are emphatic, no. Acts chapter 4, verse 12. Paul told Titus how to handle such false ideologies to the Christian worldview. Listen to what he instructs Titus to do. For there are many insubordinate, both idle talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision, whose mouths must be stopped who subvert whole households, teaching things which they ought not, for the sake of dishonest gain. One of them, a prophet of their own, said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. This testimony is true. Therefore rebuke them sharply, that they may be sound in the faith, not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men who turn from the truth. Titus chapter 1, verses 10 through 14. I can confess the Christian faith and be tolerant of all others, so long as I'm using the former definition of tolerance. Well, what is that? One, acknowledge that that other view is wrong. Two, oppose it by actually exposing it as wrong. Three, refuse to condone it or sponsor it in any way. Four, Try to make converts out of its adherents. And five, do not persecute or threaten its adherents' existence. You can persecute and threaten the ideology, but you cannot persecute and threaten the ideologue, the person who holds that view. However, here's something we need to know. A person who confesses faith in God, Jesus, and the Bible but at the same time believes that one religion is just as good as another, this person has not yet convinced God he truly confesses the right kind of faith. And I want to say this, his quote-unquote tolerance of other views is actually sin. And in addition to this critically important point, we need to make one more observation, and that is the following. Christians ought to show kindness to the opposition. Not that our kindness should ever be construed as endorsing or condoning the cause of the opposition, only that we will reach out to help them when they personally need it, when their life depends on it, when their survival, just the basic need to help another human being. We need to step up and be willing to do that. No other religious leader addressing these matters instructed his or her followers by telling them to love your enemies, 
Bless those who, who curse you. Do good to those who hate you and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. Matthew chapter 5, verse 44. But our Lord Jesus Christ did. Consider Romans chapter 12, verses 19 through 21, in which the Apostle Paul writes, Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap coals of fire on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Notice that phrase there, but rather. It's employed to prepare the reader for a thought, a radically different thought from everything they've perhaps listened to thus far in their life. And that's the pivot point of Christianity. That's what makes it so different. When we gain the right to be sons of God, we give up self-serving practices that we once exercised as children of the world. Children of the world tear each other apart. Yet Christians relinquish their right to retaliate to him who judges righteously. Instead of seeking retribution, Romans chapter 12, verse 20 teaches us to be surprisingly kind toward our adversary being attentive to the opposition's needs and thereby walking in the steps of the Savior, stepping in the light. Now, beloved, we've come to the end of this lesson. And I want to point out here a comment from Leslie B. Flynn, who writes in the book, Dare to Care Like Jesus. Quote, a Christian baroness living in the highlands of Nairobi, Kenya, told of a young national who was employed as her houseboy. After three months, he asked the baroness to give him a letter of reference to a friendly sheep some miles away. The Baroness, not wishing the houseboy to leave just when he had learned the routine of the household, offered to increase his pay. The lad replied that he was not leaving for higher pay. Rather, he had decided he would become either a Christian or a Muslim. This was why he had come to work for the Baroness for three months. He had wished to see how Christians acted. Now, he wanted to work for three months for the Sheik to observe the ways of the Muslims. Then he would decide which way of life he would follow. The Baroness was stunned as she recalled her many blemishes in her dealings with the houseboy. She could only exclaim, why didn't you tell me at the beginning? End quote. That's an alarming proposition indeed. Thinking that we are being seen all the time in light of our relationship and commitment and devotion to Jesus Christ is the best possible way to live. And whereas we may be offended or puzzled or bewildered or repulsed even by some of the bumper stickers we see, remember there's a human being inside that vehicle. There's a precious soul. And this world is confusing and Christians need to bring the light. Let us speak kindly and considerately with those who may espouse a view that is contrary to the one presented in the Bible. And let us esteem Jesus for their consideration, detailing not only the biblical record of his life and death, burial and resurrection, but how our lives are living out, walking in the steps of Jesus every day. And if you need to become a Christian, why don't you make that decision now? If you need to reach out to one of the ministers or one of the elders at the Millview Church of Christ, please reach out to us. Let us know how we can help. I pray that this lesson helps in shaping our practical living out of Christianity, and maybe it helps address some confusing things that we once thought. Beloved, I hope you have a great day. This is the Lord's Day. Let us put him first. Thank you.